السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين الحمد لله I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost for giving me the you know the the breath that I breathe for giving me the heart that I have for giving me the mind to think for myself um to give me the courage because having a mind to think for yourself and having the ability to process your thoughts without the ability to enact them or without the ability to exercise them and act upon them it really means nothing it really means nothing you know so for all of you thinkers outside of the box if you don't have the if you don't have the courage to act upon you know your thoughts and to bring them into fruition um then they're just mere thoughts they linger in the, the back of your subconscious until you forget about them um but to have the ability to to think something and then to bring it into fruition um without fear of you know commentary fear of you know repercussions that that's a that's a special gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if you are sitting at home right now listening to this understanding where i'm coming from then consider yourself blessed thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have the ability to think beyond you know the the four walls the box that others have created for you um I I just wanted to come on tonight as as a reminder, you know, to everyone with all of the chaos and everything that's going on right now. Um my heart, you know, breaks for you know um that person that is sitting at home confused. That person that is sitting trying to figure out where do I go from here? Your local mosque, your local masjid is is closed. You can't go to Jumu'ah. You know, you can't pray pray the five daily salats my heart breaks for you know people who are new converts to islam who've recently converted to the religion of islam and you know unfortunately have have been met with these challenges that are in front of us and trying to reconcile you know the, the decision to become a muslim and then you know the challenges the added <laughs> the added additional challenges that come along with not just being muslim in this in this day and time but also being a new convert trying to navigate your way through a religion that you hardly know anything about my heart breaks for for that type of person my heart breaks for the single mother who was at home with four or five six of her children at home by herself no man to be you know no man to be around no father of the children there um and just trying to manage all of you know what she has on her shoulders with her children you know and the father of the children not being actively involved in their lives and you know the vulnerability of being home especially for those of you who have young ones being home alone no protection you know you know god forbid Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbid that you know you know someone try to you know break into your home or something and and I would I would literally suggest for sisters who are married who have husbands at home to check up on sisters in the community that you know that are single mothers that are you know raising their children by themselves no man involved in their lives please check up on these sisters you know check up on these sisters uh, we're we're living in some very daunting times man and um you know for you to be sit comfortably at home with your husband and your children and you know your protection and and your good and your sister in Islam you know not too far from you that you know is single and has no man in the home and struggling trying to raise her children by herself um and for you to go to bed every night knowing that this sister you know you know I me mean? like to know her situation is what it is and for you to go to bed comfortable every night I mean that that is you know I mean the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that he is not from amongst us laysa minna he is not of us who goes to sleep at night full while your neighbor is hungry and although the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was referring to the the physical hunger of the absence of food and 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 and, and drink i'm talking about hunger and in the absence of you know security safety the absence of you know uh companionship 
the the absence, you know, for, for whatever whatever the issue is. Check up on your sister in Islam. Brothers, do the same. Pick up the phone. Brothers that you haven't spoken to in a while, pick the phone up. Make sure, check up on them. Make sure they're okay. If you brought a brother to Islam, if you were responsible for giving the brother dawah, don't, don't take pride in the accolades of saying, yeah, I called him to Islam. I gave this brother dawah, whatever the case may be. If you brought him to the re religion of Islam by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then also see him through. See him through. Don't just sever ties and say, well, you know, I did my part. I, I gave him dawah and I called him to Islam. Okay, but now that he's a Muslim, you're also, you're leaving crumbs on the table because you could be teaching him wudu. You could be teaching him al-fatiha. You can be teaching him how to pray. You can be teach him the power of dhikr, the power of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is something that is very simple. It's few words, few phrases, but have very deep meanings, very deep impact on the heart. That's all crumbs that you're leaving on the table for somebody else to take advantage of or not. Nonetheless, if you are responsible for bringing someone to Islam, check upon them, man. Make sure they're okay, especially in this time that we are living in right now. But I wanted to take the time out to, um, to address something that I think is, is very important. So I want you to follow me for a second. Um, if you remember when the Prophet ﷺ died, if any of you are familiar with that story, all right, you remember the pandemonium, you remember the chaos that, you know, had overshadowed the community of the Prophet ﷺ. Anas anhu, he said that I remember the day that the Prophet ﷺ entered into Medina. وَقَدْ أَضَاءَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ That it, 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 it lightened, it illuminated everything. The whole day was bright. Follow me. He said, I remember the day that the Prophet ﷺ entered into Al Medina. Allah, that everything was illuminated. It was bright. It was a bright day. It was a beautiful, bright day. The day that the Prophet ﷺ entered into Al Medina. He said, And I remember the day that the Prophet ﷺ died. Everything was dark. It was a dark day. It was a dark day. The day that the Prophet ﷺ died, he's trying to give us a glimpse into what the atmosphere was like. Similar to what we are experiencing, just, just a little bit of what we are experiencing today with you know the coronavirus, with the you know the, the confusion. It's not even the coronavirus. I don't even want to go into that. Just the confusion that is surrounding, you know, what do we do? People going to the stores and buying up tissue and buying up all types of disinfected product, the disinfect products and hand sanitizers. And, you know, people have lost all sense of humanness. You know, people are not even human anymore, almost like zombies. It's like I'm out for myself. I need to take care of myself. I need to look out for myself. And I mean, you know, when you think about the pan, pan, pandemonium that is going on right now with, you know, Costco's and you go into your local grocery store and things are missing and long lines and people are agitated and people are angry and upset and frustrated and confused. Can you imagine what this dunya would look like? You know, <laughs> you know, what I mean, like when when real trials start to hit, you know, the world. And, the, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a glimpse at the day when people will hear the trumpet. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that, you know, Tara nasa sukara wa ma hum bi sukara wa lakin adab Allah shadeed. That you will see people as if they were in a drunken state. When you think about a person who was intoxicated, he said that you will see people, wa tara nasa sukara, you will see people as if they are sukara, they, that they are drunk, inebriated, they are intoxicated. Well, but they will not be intoxicated. They won't be intoxicated. But the punishment of Allah is severe. Fear. Everybody will be running frantically. And the, the, the pregnant woman will spit out her load, will, will deliver immediately. Right? This, this is the, the, the frantic climate of you know fear and, and frantic and pandemonium 
This is the climate that Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to give us a glimpse into what the world, what people will look like in the event that they see the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala coming. They see the sun rising from the west. Right? And then there's some people who are living during that time, Muslims that will be living during that time, so they say, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. You know, oh, they say they predicted, you know, once every 1.4 million years, the sun is supposed to rise from uh, from the West. MashaAllah. So everything is a conspiracy theory. How about the thoughts that you have about things being a conspiracy theory? How about your thoughts is a conspiracy theory? How about that? Because we have an excuse for everything. Because we never want to see reality for what it is. We never want to see reality for what it is. So as long as conspiracy theories exist, we'll chalk it up as that. And that way we can continue living our lives. I don't ever have to invest any more thought in it. I don't have to invest any more thought. God forbid I have to think. I forgot which author said it, but he said the, the worst thing for human beings to do is to is to think. And, and many don't. Most don't. They don't think for themselves. They just do. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a glimpse into the pandemonium, given us a glimpse into the confusion and the chaos that will exist due to fear. You will see people as if they are in a drunken state, inebriated, not fully accessing the frontal lobe cortex, the frontal cortex. This is where we make all, all of our decisions as human beings. This is the rational part of our brain. And when that rational part of the brain has been compromised, sometimes due to fear, extreme fear, pay attention. Sometimes due to extreme fear, the frontal lobe, the cortex of the brain where we make all of our decisions has been compromised and we can't make rational decisions. So, this is what is happening now. You're seeing people as if they are in a drunken state. You're buying a whole pallet full of toilet tissue. As if the coronavirus is somehow, you know, a disease that is affecting your anal. You know, I mean, like, I don't, I really don't understand for the life of me. I really don't understand for the life of me, you know, the obsession. But here again, people are in a drunken state. They don't have any act. They don't have access to the frontal lobe. They don't have access to the frontal cortex of the brain. And so therefore, the decisions are not going to be rational because it's driven by fear. Fear has compromised their ability to make rational decisions. You guys follow me? So now you know why when you go out into the world. And the sad thing about it is that as Muslims, we are supposed to be, you know, the, distinguish, the distinguishing factor in a world full of chaos and a world full of pandemonium and a world full of confusion. You would think that the one who says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you would think that that individual who says that and understands what it means that he or she would be the determining factor, would be the distinguishing factor from everything else and everyone else. I mean, if, if Muslims are just as confused and just as in fear and just as, you know, uh, you know, overwhelmed and overcome with fear and anxiety as everybody else, then, then what good is the guidance of the Quran and the Sunnah? I'm, I'm just asking a question. What good is it to have all of this guidance when we are just as in fear and confused as everyone else? You would think that the Muslim out of all people would be the one like while everybody is, you know, trying to make sense of what's going on around them. The Muslim in those moments relies on his Iman, relies on their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of the things that Allah has told us. As when they tried to instill fear in the Prophet ﷺ by telling him, oh, the Ahzab, you know, the Confederates, they're gathered against you. You have the Kufar, you have, you know, the Munafikun, you have um, the, the tribes of the Jews, they're all uniting against you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, فَلَمَّا رَأَى الْأَحْزَابِ 
قالوا هذا ما وعدنا الله ورسوله وصدق الله ورسوله that this when they saw the confederates united against them they said this is what Allah and his messenger promised us and Allah and his messenger promised us the truth and it only increased them in iman in faith with tathbita and steadfastness they never wavered there was no wavering in the faith steadfastness certainty and faith they increased in faith in the times that normal people succumb to fear the believer relies on his faith defers to his faith there is no wavering there's no shaking in that you understand but in our day and time we are just as much in fear as muslims and just as much confused if not more confused than many of those who are not muslim then it's just like well, well what distinguishes us from everybody else That's not to say that fear is not real. Fear fear is real. But as a Muslim, we are not controlled by fear. That's not what drives us. That's not what determines our decisions. When the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was laying down underneath the tree and he hung his sword up and the hypocrite came and grabbed his sword and he stood over top of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with a knife at the Prophet's throat. And he told them, and he looked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the face and he said, "Man ya asimu kamini ya Muhammad, who's going to protect you from me, Muhammad?" And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam looked the man in his face and he said, "Allah, God. No fear. No hesitation, no fear, no nothing. Allah, God. Just because it seems like the odds are against me, it does not interfere with my knowledge of my Lord. It doesn't interfere with that." My knowledge of God, my knowledge of my Lord never changes despite the circumstances and the situations that I may find myself in. We are not driven by fear. So going back to the story um Anas he said that I remember the day when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam entered into Medina it was the brightest day that we had ever seen. He said and I remember the day that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam died and it was the darkest day that I had ever seen in my life. And then, you know, as it is the case with the death of anyone, sometimes we refuse. We you know, here again our frontal lobe is compromised. So we're not thinking rationally. We refuse to accept the, you know, the inevitable. We refuse to accept, you know, the reality that is staring us right in our faces. So Umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu starts waving his sword. He says, "Wallahi, the next person that says that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is dead, I'm going to chop his head off." Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not dead. He left like Prophet Moses left, like Prophet Musa left to go talk to Allah and then he's going to come back after a period of time. He didn't want to accept the reality. And Abu Bakr radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu he came out and he made his famous speech in front of the sahaba to bring back, you know, direction to the ummah, bring direction back to the community. and and this is what i'm attempting to do not not that i'm on the level of abu bakr obviously but just trying to help bring some direction in a time of complete confusion bringing some direction in in the time of confusion utter confusion even amongst those who have the quran and the sunnah but still don't know what to do with it and this is one of the reasons why you know here in america no one is in fear of muslims they they're not afraid of muslims not necessarily in a physical way they're not they're not afraid of you know what our potential is because they know what the Quran and the Sunnah contains of truth but they also know that as Americans you know we're not going to do nothing with it we'll attack one another we'll beat up on one another we'll shame and embarrass and you know downgrade and you know we'll we'll do all of that to one another but we we're, we're not going to you know go any further with this truth of tawhid that we have and they know that This is why they were never in fear. They let you have your mosque, let you have your preachers, they let you preach your message. You know, it ain't gonna go anywhere. You get a, f- a couple of converts a year. I mean, but what are you gonna change? It's not gonna. You're not gonna revolutionize anything. You're not gonna change anything. You're not gonna speak any truth to power. You know what I mean? So they know that. So Abu Bakr radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu. he's trying to bring direction back to the community so he stands up and he says whoever says that muhammad is dead that you know muhammad you know whoever used to worship muhammad then muhammad is dead 
Meaning enough with the personality worship. Yes, he was a man. We loved him. But the truth, his legacy of Tawheed that he left behind, we still have to carry that on. The legacy doesn't stop with the death of the legend. You know what I mean? The legacy doesn't stop. So whoever used to worship Muhammad, Muhammad is dead. But whoever worships Allah, then Allah is ever living and he never dies. And then he quoted a verse. This is the point here. He quoted a verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلٌ أَفَإِمْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلًا قَلَبَتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ وَمَنْ يَنْقَلِبْ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ فَلَيْ يَدُرُّ اللَّهَ الشَّيْئَ وَسَيَجْزِ اللَّهُ شَاكِرِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that Muhammad is nothing more than a messenger. Now mind you, this verse was revealed way before this incident happened. It was already mojud, already present in the, already written in the Quran, already there. This ayah has been there long before the Prophet Sallallahu died. Abu Bakr radiallahu in his attempt to bring direction back to the community, in this moment, he reaches into the Quran and pulls this ayah out and applies it. Yutabbiq ala hadhi al He applies it to this situation. That's fiqh, fiddin. That is understanding your religion. It's one thing to know the ayah because you memorize it. It's another thing to be knee deep in a situation and be able to reach into the Quran, pull out what you need, and apply it to the fiqh fit deen. That is an understanding of the religion. All right? It's not about, as Imam Ahmed said, you know, laysa al-ilm bi riwayah but knowledge is not knowing a lot of narrations, memorizing a lot of hadith. Oh, you memorize Sahih al-Bukhari. Great. But if you can't reach into Sahih al-Bukhari and the 7,300 and some uh, uh, hadith that are in Sahih al-Bukhari, غير مقررة, without repetition, if you can't reach into Sahih al-Bukhari and pull out the hadith from Bab this or Bab that, the chapter this or the chapter that, and apply it to a situation that is just simply memorization. You're following in the tradition of memorization of Sahih al-Bukhari. Great. That's alhamdulillah. That is awesome. I'm not downplaying that. Awesome. But you are just in a separate category of people who have memorized Sahih al-Bukhari. As for the fuqaha, those who have thick of the deen, ma wasalt ba'd. You have not arrived. You have not arrived at that station yet. You are simply someone who has memorized Sahih al-Bukhari. And that's great. And for you is the reward. But as far as being in that class or that category of people who have memorized Sahih al-Bukhari but also know how to make tatbiq, to make application of those ahadith in the situations that are necessary or that require those hadith, that is a special class of scholars. That's a special class of scholarship that many of us have not reached, including myself. Many of us have not reached that point. But Abu Bakr simply reaches into the Quran out of 6,000 some odd verses in the Quran. He reaches in, pulls out this ayah, and applies it to that situation. That Muhammad is nothing more than a messenger. Many messengers have come before him. If he dies or is killed, will you turn back on your heels? Meaning when the situation that you have invested so much of yourself in, the individual that you have invested so much of yourself in is no longer there. Will that same investment, that same energy, will it remain? Will that same energy be there? Will you turn back on your heels? And whoever turns back on his heels will not harm Allah in the least. Meaning if you leave Islam, you decide this religion is not working for you. You decide Islam is not, you know, you ain't cut out for all of this. If you decide that that's, that's your decision, you decide to leave Islam. You will not harm God in the least. And Allah will reward abundantly those who are shakirin, those who are grateful. The point from this whole entire story is Umar's statement when he heard Abu Bakr recite this ayat. Umar said, Umar he said, it was as if this was the first time I had ever heard that ayat before. Meaning, he heard the ayat before, 
but the ayat did not resonate with him before like it did in that very moment. Because now there was a circumstance, there was a situation whereby that ayat now is, of course, it's relevant. The Quran is always relevant, whether you understand it or you don't understand it. It's relevant. What's, what's not relevant is your understanding of it. Once your understanding of that ayat catches up, the relevance is there. The relevance resides with the ayah. Once your brain, once your understanding catches up to it, then it becomes relevant to you. So it's always relevant. It's just waiting for your understanding to catch up to it. It's just waiting for your understanding to catch up. Can you guys hear and see? Unfortunately, I cut off the the replies because the replies get ridiculous. So I'm hoping that, you know, you guys can hear and see. The point that I'm making, if someone is listening now and you have my WhatsApp or you are uh, one of the students in my class, if you can hear and you can see, please send me, shoot me a text or someone that's uh, listening that has my number, shoot me a text and let me know that the Periscope is still working. Um, I just received a text message that said it stopped, but on my end, it's fine. I don't know if it's um, on someone else's end. So the point that I'm making is that Abu Bakr, uh, Umar, he said it was as if, okay, okay, thanks, I got it. Uh, so if your Periscope is going in and out, refresh your browser. Perhaps there's just something wrong with your um, on your end, but uh, I just received a few text messages um, that everything is fine on that end. Okay, so Umar he said um, he said it was as if this was the first time I had ever heard that verse before, and that that doesn't mean that he never heard the verse before. What he's saying is that the verse didn't did not make sense to him up until that point. Now the verse actually had relevance. So that brings me to my next point. And that is that there's a verse from the Quran that I, I love. It's a section of, of verses in the Quran that I love that I recite often. Um, and in the past, maybe say week, I have been reciting these verses often uh, in my Maghrib and Isha prayers. Um, I don't know why. It's just my heart just feels inclined you know, considering everything that's going on right now with the coronavirus and, you know, statewide shutdowns and, you know, the, the, the chaos and everything that's going on. There's, there's a section, there's a cluster of verses from the Quran that just just continues to resonate with me in this moment. Right. It continues to resonate with me in this moment. And I almost feel like how Omar felt with those that verse. I feel like with these verses, as if this was the first time I'm, I have ever heard these verses. And I mean, these verses, I'm sure as they resonate with me, they've resonated with many of you, um, but not like today. I mean, today, they literally mean something totally different. They mean something very different today than they meant before this fitna that we fell into. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Subhanallah these, these verses, man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Indeed, those who say, listen to Allah's words, Indeed, those who say, Allah, God is my Lord. And that has a meaning within itself. Rabbun Allah. That Allah is my Lord. Allah is your Rabb. 
your Lord. He is your caretaker. He is the one that makes sure all of what you need for your survival in this world, as well as in the next, it resides with him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is a razak controls your provision. He is a shakur, the one who is appreciative of every little good that you do. He is alim. He is the one who is most knowledgeable of everything that is before you, behind you. He is al-qadir. He has power over everything. To him belongs the keys of the heavens and the earth. All of our resources, everything that you need to be marboob, to be taken care of, resides with your Rabb, resides with your Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna ladina qalu rabbun Allahu. Indeed, those who say Allah is my Lord. This is my Lord, the one who is responsible for me. As Ibrahim alayhi salam, he said, وَإِذَا مَرِدْتُ فَهُوَ الْيَشْفِينَ When I'm sick, he cures me. When I'm hungry, he feeds me. The one who I hope that he's going to, you know, forgive me on the day of judgment. All of my needs are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ Everything that I need for my survival resides with him subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ Indeed, those who say, Allah is my Lord, and then afterwards they are upright. They live by that. They live according to that. Because it's one thing to say that Allah is my Lord, and it's another thing to live your life in accordance with that statement. That is a belief that is followed up by action. It's one thing to say Allah is my Lord. It's another thing to live your life like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your Lord. Indeed, those who say Allah is my Lord and then afterwards they are upright. Staqamu, yastaqimu. That fast on that belief. They don't waver in that. Not due to fear, not due to embarrassment, not due to love, not due to like, not due to any of that. I remain, remain steadfast on that belief. The angels descend upon them in that moment. They say, Allah is my Lord. And then afterwards, they walk upright on that. The angels descend upon them to give them confirmation. Three things. Don't fear. If you say that Allah is my Lord and then afterwards you live your life in accordance to that, then you should have no fear. No fear. Say, O Muhammad, to your companions, Len yusibuna. Nothing can befall us except what Allah has decreed for it to befall us. Who are Mulana? He is our guardian and our protector. Nothing can happen to me. The Prophet ﷺ told Ibn Abbas, know that if an entire nation stood together to bring you some benefit, they would only benefit you with to the extent that Allah has already decreed for you to be benefited with. And if they were to gather, an entire nation was to gather uh, together to harm you with something. And here you are today, we are being harmed by an entire nation, a government that plots against its own citizens for its own self agenda, for its own agenda. Here we are, an entire nation gathering together to bring some harm to you. That if an entire nation gathered together to harm you, to bring you some harm, to do you some harm, they would only be able to harm you to the extent that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already decreed for you to be harmed with. That the pins have been lifted and the pages are dry. The pins have been lifted, the pages are dry. Meaning what is written is written. It will not change. Nothing to fear. Don't fear. Don't fear nor grieve. 
وَأَبْشِرُ and receive glad tidings. So I'm saying to you right now, if you said Allah is my Lord and then afterwards you are living your life in accordance to that, do not fear, don't grieve, but receive glad tidings. وَأَبْشِرُ بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُوْعَدُونَ And receive glad tidings of the Jannah, of the paradise that you have been promised. Then the angels continue, نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاؤُكُمْ We are your guardians, your protectors. We are your friends. أَوْلِيَاؤُكُمْ We are your أَوْلِيَاء Your friends, your protectors. فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ In the life of this world, as well as in the hereafter. Understand. Act like Allah is your Lord. Stop with this confusion. Stop with this running out, monkey see, monkey do, doing what you see everybody else doing. We are your friends and your protectors in the life of this world as well as in the hereafter. The angels got you. Allah will make sure that you are protected as much as he decreed for you to be protected. The Prophet Sallallahu said about this hadith, as it was mentioned on the authority of, of Anas, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about this ayah, he said, Inna ladina qalu rabbun Allahu thumma istaqamu. He, qu he quoted this ayah one time. Indeed, those who say Allah is my Lord, and then afterwards he's upright. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after reciting this ayah, he said, qala hannas thumma kafara akhtaruhum. He said, many people have said this. Many people who have said, Allah is my Lord. He said, Thumma kafara akhtarhum, And then most of them disbelieved. Many people have said, Allah is my Lord. And then most of them afterwards have disbelieved. فَمَنْ مَاتَ عَلِيهَا فَهُوَ مِنْ مِنْ استقامه. And whoever dies on this, dies on Allah is my Lord, meaning and then afterwards they are upright, they die on that, then they have remained steadfast. Remaining steadfast is not just saying it, but living your life by it all the way up into the last moments of your life. Belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dictates a certain mindset which cannot be controlled by fear, by money, by power, by government, by safety, by security, or by a masjid. The masjid does not control my faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Close the masjid down. I wouldn't give a damn. Shut all of them down. That ain't going to stop me from praying. That ain't going to stop me from making dhikr. That ain't going to stop me from having jumu'ah. Period. Close them all down. Because many of the masajid are so, you know, I, I, I don't want I didn't want to be negative here. But I just think that some of us are just so full of BS. Some of us just, we spend our entire lives just simply trying to be politically correct, trying to be on par with the, you know, status quo, even against our own interests, even against our own spiritual interests as Muslims. We just want to be politically correct. We want to do what we see everybody else is doing. And shout out to all of the messages that are still open for Jumu'ah, still open for the daily Salah. Shout out to all of the masajid, man. I have nothing but the, the utmost respect for you because you understand that the concern is not just about, oh, you don't want to catch coronavirus, but you also don't want to leave behind those who need Jumu'ah, <laughs> those who their Iman thrives off of Jumu'ah. Don't you know that there are Muslims who are only Muslim right now because of Jumu'ah? The only foothold that they have in the religion of Islam, the only thing that is keeping them going is coming to the Friday prayer. And you have some masajid who didn't even consider that. Oh, we got a, the coronavirus. And, and, just, and you just go without even processing. Without even processing. But belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dictates a certain mindset which cannot be controlled by fear, by money, by status, safety, security. All of which we have witnessed with a simple glance 
into the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions. When you just take a simple glance into the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you see men and women who could not, once they ingested this concept of Tawheed, they could not be controlled. That faith in Tawheed, that faith in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala dictated a certain mindset that would not be changed for anything. Belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order for you to say Allah is my Lord and then afterwards be upright that comes with a certain mindset. That once I say Allah is my Lord and I follow that up with a lifestyle that brings that concept into fruition, that comes with a certain mindset that cannot be bargained with, that cannot be compromised, that cannot be changed under any circumstances. Imam Ahmed Rahim Allah Ta'ala dwelled in prison for how many years? Guy entered into the prison and told Imam Ahmed, doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the Quran, La taqtulu anfusakum. In Allah kana bikum rahima. Don't kill yourselves. For indeed God is too merciful to you. Doesn't Allah say that in the Quran? Imam Ahmed said yes. He said, well, just say the Quran is created and alleviate yourself of this. You, why are you putting yourself through this? You don't have to go through this. Just say the Qur'an is created and get yourself out of prison. And Imam Ahmed, rahim Allah ta'ala, he told the man, go to the window and look outside and tell me what you see. The man went to the window and he looked outside and saw all of these people waiting to see what Imam Ahmed was going to say. Is the Qur'an created or is it not created? What are the people, people sitting around waiting for Imam Ahmed to see what is he going to say? He's the Imam. What is he going to say? And Imam Ahmed told the man, look out the window and tell me what you see. The man said, I see people, just rows and rows of people with pens in their hands and papers in their hands waiting to hear what Imam Ahmed is going to say about the Quran. And Imam Ahmed looked at the man and he said, He said, am I going to lead all of these people astray just to save myself? He said, Wallahi aqtul nafsi wa la udhillu ha'ula. He said, Wallahi, I will kill myself before I will lead all of these people astray. Because belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something that you can't bargain with. You can't negotiate with. It comes with a certain mindset that cannot be altered, cannot be changed by circumstances, situations. So I'm saying that to say, as we see many masajid closing their doors and what appears to be uh, you know, a, a general benefit for the community, my appeal is to those who Jumwa, the Friday prayer, was to their iman, was to their faith, like the ventricular you know, uh, assistant device, the VAD, is to the heart of a person who is surviving solely by it and by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know how a person is brain dead, and the only thing that they're surviving off of is that machine, that VAD machine? There's some people who their faith, their belief, their faith in Allah, their spirituality is surviving off of Jumu'ah, just like a person who is brain dead, their heart is surviving off of the VAD machine. There's some people like that right now. And my question is, you know, if you miss, how many Jumwas are you going to miss? You know, perhaps the, the Masajid open back up for the normal Jumwa three weeks from now, four weeks from now, a month from now. But what are you going to do in the meanwhile? What are you going to do in the interim? Are you going to sit around and wait for the Masjid to open back up before you decide to do something about your heart? Your heart contingent, your, your relationship with God contingent on a masjid opening or closing? La wallahi. La wallahi. Some of the salaf, some of the scholars of the past, they used to say, Dhikrullahi lil qalb, mithlul mal is samak. That the remembrance of Allah to the heart is like water is to fish. That's what the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, when you think about it, like many people miss Jumu'ah Friday. Alhamdulillah, I, I, I was afforded an opportunity to be in an environment where the Jumu'ah was established, even though the masjid was closed. And I was surrounded by people who were determined to have Jumu'ah, despite the circumstances we were in. And, 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 and for that, I'm grateful to even have been in, in that environment. 
But there were many Muslims who did not attend Jumu'ah last Friday under the guise of coronavirus. All right. So now you have you're caught between a rock and a hard place. Do you stay at home and avoid, you know, the coronavirus, which is essentially the flu? We're putting a name on it. But if a person had pneumonia or a person had the flu, how do you distinguish those people from somebody who has corona? It's the same symptoms. It's asinine. You're just putting a label on it. But here we go. We just run with it. Oh, he has corona. Basically, he has the flu or he has pneumonia. It's the same exact symptoms. We're just now putting a label on it to instill fear in people. So now you got walking around people, giving people elbows. You don't want to shake hands anymore. You know, you see, we have completely detached ourselves from our deen. And somebody can say, well, I'm taking my precautions. I don't want to get it. You do whatever's best for you, man. But no fear dictates to me how I practice my religion. I'm sorry. You, you can do whatever you want to do under the guise of precaution, under the guise of protecting yourself. You do whatever's best for you. I'm not dictating to you what to do one way or another. I'm saying fear does not dictate to me how I practice my religion. I'm sorry. Because that's what essentially what the media, everybody that's exacerbating the situation, every single time a person gets, oh, we now have another confirmed virus. Now we now have another confirmed virus. Now we have another confirmed virus. Now it's 3,000. Now it's 3,001. Now it's 3,007. It's just like you're reporting on each and every individual case. And with each and every reporting, it's instilling more and more fear in people, which takes away the more fear that is instilled in us the more illogical we think. Understand how that works. Because the more fear you absorb, the more you, the less and less access to your frontal lobe you have. You don't have access to this because you are fearing with this. These two are connected. As a matter of fact, they're used interchangeably in the Quran. The mind as well as the heart, they're used interchangeably. The intellect and the heart, they're used interchangeably in the Quran, synonymously, because there's a connection there. But the more and more fear that is instilled in you, the less and less access you have to the rational part of your brain. So therefore, you're not thinking rational. You're just making decisions based upon fear. And what you think is going to put you in a safer situation. Wallahalazim, sadiqani, ya ikhwan, brothers and sisters, the only thing that will keep you safe right now is your faith in God. And the sad part about that is that many non-Muslims understand that. It's the Muslims that have a hard time understanding that. You want to be safe. You, I get it. You want to be safe. There's no safety or security except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no safety. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi rabbil alameen. There's no power, no might, no strength except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no safety, there's no security except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who are Mawlana? He is our protector, our guardian subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى الْحَيِّ الَّذِي لَا يَمُوتْ Put your trust in the one that is ever living that will never die. Because one that is ever living, that is where all your resources is. The one that is going to die, his resources are limited. The human being, government, their resources are limited. Your trust is in the one that never dies. The one whose resources is are whose resources are unlimited. But we'll do anything for safety and security, which is why people will bow down to the Dajjal. People will accept the Dajjal as God because you are looking for safety and security. And some people have already done that. You'll sell your soul just to be safe. There are some things that are actually worth dying for, believe it or not. There are some things that are actually worth dying for. But we want absolute safety and security and we'll sell anything just to have it. Just as long as I'm safe. I don't have to practice my religion. I don't have to practice Islam. I can give up my deen and I'm still safe. I just want to be safe. I want to protect my family. I want your protection is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kulla yusibuna illa ma katab Allahu lana. I mean, like, are we, you know, if this is, you know, just this small little two, three weeks, 
has, has been enough to detach many Muslims away from their religion. Just this short span of time. And now you have, you know, complete entire states that are going on 24 hour lockdown. Like, where does that leave? Where does that leave you from here? Like, once everything, if everything clears up, you know, in three weeks, in two weeks when everybody goes back to school, or three weeks when everything seems to go back to some type of normalcy, where does that leave your faith? Because you haven't prayed in the masjid in three weeks, two weeks. Your iman was surviving off of Jumrah. Where does that leave you? But, you know, some of the Salaf, they said, you know, that dhikrullah lil qalb kil ma'i lil samak. That the remembrance of Allah to the heart is like water is to fish. Can't, you can't survive without it. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, inna fil jannah, inna fil dunya jannatan, man lam yadkhulha, lam yadkhul jannah fil jannat al-akhirah. Qalu wa ma hiya, ya imam, qala mahabbatullah wa dhikrahu, wa dhikrahu. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, I'm almost done. He has some very profound words. He said that in this life, in the fiddunya jannatan, in this life there is a jannah, there's a paradise. Men lam yadkhulha, lam yadkhul jannat al-akhirah. He said, he who does not enter into the paradise that is in this life will not enter into the paradise of the hereafter. He said, in this dunya, in this world, there is a paradise. Now mind you, Ibn Taymiyyah possibly, because he spent many years of his life in prison, possibly wrote this comment while he was in prison. Think about the mentality of someone who is behind bars, who makes a statement like this. You got to escape physically. You got to, you, they have you physically, but you have to escape mentally. You have to escape spiritually. They can have the physical body. They can have it. But what they can't have is this. The worst type of prison that a person can be in is the one that has no bars. The prison around your heart, the prison around your mind. It's the worst type of prison. The physical bars, you can have the physical body. You can have that. But what you don't own is this and this. Ibn Taymiyyah said, in the dunya jannatin, in this dunya, in this world, there is a paradise. Whoever does not enter it in this life will not enter into the paradise in the hereafter. And they asked him, well, what is this paradise you're talking about? He said, mahabbatullahi wa dhikrihi, wa dhikrahu. It's the love of Allah and his remembrance. That is Jannah in this life. To escape, delve deeply into your love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you love Allah, your love of Allah will drive you to do things that the average, the normal person cannot do. Your love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will drive you to tolerate levels of difficulty and, and, and calamity and misfortune and challenges that the average person can't stomach, can't tolerate. That's how you escape your love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they were severing the leg of Abdullah ibn Zubayr or Urwa ibn Zubayr, when they were severing his leg because he, he had got bitten by a snake and the poison started spreading through his leg and they asked, you know, can we give you some khamar, some liquor to drink? And Urwa said, khamar is haram fi dini. That khamar is alcohol is haram, is forbidden in my religion. I'm not going to drink no alcohol to numb me to the pain. So he said, well, then what are you going to do? We've got to saw your leg off. And he said, I'm going to remember Allah. I'll escape with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's my escape. The remembrance of Allah, the remembrance of God is the way that I escape. And he began to remember Allah. Subhanallah. Allah Akbar. La ilaha illallah. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Subhanallah wa bihamdi. Subhanallah al-azim. Until the pain got so excruciating that he eventually fell unconscious. When he regained consciousness, he saw his leg laying over on the table. And he said, is that my leg? Have he originally? Is that, is that my leg? He said, yes. He said, bring it to me. And he took his leg and he kissed it. And he said, wallahi, Allah knows I have never taken one footstep towards you and some, towards something, never taken one footstep with you towards something that is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ever. So how do you think that your iman will survive without Jumu'ah when the masajid decide to reopen? Where do you think that, you know, your iman will be in terms of your spirituality? Your iman is not contingent on the opening or closing of a masjid. 
your iman is contingent upon your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'll end with this. The scholars, they differ with respect to how many people are needed in order for Jumu'ah to be fulfilled. So this is a suggestion that I have to myself first and to anybody else who chooses to adhere to that. Rather than sitting at home or being at work on Friday, letting Friday after Friday after Friday go by because the masjid has, the masajid have decided to remain closed because of the, you know, fear of coronavirus, right? And then you kind of relying on the masajid in order to keep your iman, your faith replenished. I would suggest that this matter of fiqh that we have covered years ago that I never thought we it would ever be relevant for us, but it's relevant today. I remember in Islamic University, we were covering the chapter of Jumu'ah. And then we came to the section about Jumu'ah that we talked about the etiquettes. And then we talked about a, a fiqh issue regarding Jumu'ah. And that was how many people are actually needed in order for it to be considered a valid Jumu'ah. I never, for a million years, I never thought that this would be necessary. Even when I taught, you know, the chapter of Jumu'ah in the masjid when I was an imam, I kind of skipped over this because I never saw it to be relevant, except in the cases where people work at a particular environment, there's Muslims in an environment, and they won't let you go out for Jumu'ah to the masjid, so you end up having to pray, having to pray Jumu'ah on the premises at your job. I, that was the only time that I ever saw this to be relevant. But now... I see it to be totally relevant in this day and time. Since the masajid are closed for Jumu'ah. The, the, the Jumu'ah don't stop because the masjids are closed. I'm sorry. In my eyes, in my book, people can say whatever they want to say. I'm saying Jumu'ah, the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, does not stop because you, in your attempt to be politically correct, decide to close your masjid. You can close your masjid. We still going to have Jumu'ah. I don't care. I don't care if we got to go to a brother's house and we're five people in the house and somebody gives the khutbah, we call their then. We hear the two khutbahs, we call their then, their kama, and we pray. We are establishing Jumu'ah. I'm sorry, my iman. And many of you know me personally. You know, in 2016, I tried to take my family and leave and move to uh, Sharjah, which is in the UAE, United Arab Emirates. I was literally leaving here, going, relocating to what I thought was a Muslim country. Little did I know, Right. I got to the UAE and I realized that religion was not amongst the top priorities in that society. I thought I spent many years of my life living in Saudi Arabia. When I got to the UAE, I thought it was going to be pretty much the same thing, completely different program. And after being there for a little over a month, I decided this is not the environment for me and my family. And I left. The Jumu'ah was literally 15, 20 minutes flat. And every single Jumu'ah was, you know, some random issue. Salat, the importance of Salat. The import, you know, and I mean, most of the people only come to Jumu'ah the second half of the Jumu'ah. The first half, when the imam first gets on the minbar, is only like 15, 20 people there. Meanwhile, the masjid is huge and beautiful. For what reason? I have no idea. And this is part of the prediction that the Prophet Sallallahu the prophecy that the Prophet Sallallahu gave us that huda, that there will come a time where the only thing that will be left of Islam is the name, the only thing that will be left of the Quran is the writing of the words, and the masajid will be amira, will be frequented, the masajid will be muzakhraf, as the Prophet Sallallahu said in another hadith, that it will be muzakhrafa, it will be beautified, these big beautiful masjids, but it will be void of any type of guidance. No guidance coming out of the masjid. You can't go in the masjid and get any guidance. As a matter of fact, in some masjid, you might go in and get misguided. Misguided. Big, beautiful masjid. And, you know, most of the jama'ah show up the second half of Jumu'ah. And I said to myself one day, sitting on the masjid floor, listening to the khutbah, you know, trying to keep myself from falling asleep. I said, if I stay here any longer than I have already been here, I'm going to end up becoming a lay person. I will just be a worker that gets up, go to work every day. And that's pretty much it because my Iman would not be able to survive with this type of preaching. My Iman would not be able to survive in this environment. It won't. And I left for the sake of my deen, for the sake of my heart, for the sake of my, my spirituality, for the sake of my faith. I could have stayed making good money, decent money, decent living. Anybody ever been to Dubai? Dubai was right over the bridge from Sharjah. 
20 minute ride over the bridge. <laughs> I can go to Dubai and hang out. I can go to Dubai Mall. I can go to, you know, Elaine. I can go wherever. You know what I mean? Like, you, that's paradise on earth if there was one. But I left all of that. And I'm not saying this for any praise. I'm just saying that sometimes you, you have to choose your principles. Sometimes you have to choose your faith despite the circumstances that are in front of you. But the scholars, there's a chapter in Jumwa, fifth issue in Jumwa. How many people is necessary in order for it to be considered a valid Jumwa? There are a number of positions of scholars, and this is actually five positions. So I'll, I'll run through them real quickly, and then I'll end with the most preferable position. Um, the second opinion... I, I made the opinion that I wanted to give you guys my first, so I'll make that my last. The second opinion is Thalatha uh, Fa'ekta, three and more, because that goes based upon the word Jama'a. Jama'a means in the Arabic language three or more. So you have Wahid, you have one, and you have, uh, then you have two, and then you have three. So three constitutes a Jama'a. Three constitutes a Jama'a, a congregation. All right, so that's. In, according to the Arabic language. So three or more. So if three or more people are present, one person to give the khutbah, and three people listening or more, it constitutes as a jumwah. The third opinion is that it has to be at least 40 people. And this was the position of the Shafi'iyah, those who follow the Shafi'i Madhab. And this was based upon a particular hadith where a group of people, um, uh, Zarara, the, the, the companion, they uh, established a salat, the first salat that they established in their village. And he was asked, how many people you guys had for your salat? And they had 40. So some scholars use that as a premise or as a foundation. Not really thabit, not really firm enough for us to say concretely that it has to be 40 people. Nonetheless, it's a position. Um, the third position is that it has to be 12 people. And this is based upon the ayah in Surah to Jumu'ah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا رَأَوْ تِجَارَةً أَوْ لَهْوًا إِنْ فَضُّوا إِلَيْهَا وَتَرَكُوكَ قَائِمًا That some of the sahaba, they were sitting listening to the khutbah with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then the caravan came back from Damascus carrying, you know, goods from Damascus and when the people heard the caravan, you know, outside, they got up and they left Jumu'ah and they left the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam giving the khutbah by himself and they ran to get the merchandise off of the uh, caravan. And the only people that stayed were 12 people. So based upon that narration, some scholars say that uh, it's 12 people. But there's nothing concretely that defines that those people stayed because the bare minimum had to be 12. It was just it just so happened to be 12. So that's not, in my opinion, not necessarily concrete. The fourth opinion, that is that four people. All right. And that is the position of the Hanafis. The Hanafis are of the position, position that it has to be at least four people. And that's the Mu'addin, the Imam, and two people. The Mu'addin, the Imam, and two people. And that is based upon the ayat in Surah Al-Jumu'ah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا نُوذِيَ لِلصَّلَاةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمُعَةِ فَاسْعُوا إِلَى ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ And when you hear the call to Jumu'ah, meaning the Mu'addin calling the Adhan to Jumu'ah, then hasten to the remembrance of Allah. So they're saying that the Mu'addin is calling here then, the Imam is going to give the khutbah, and the bare minimum of people who has to listen is two. So that's four in total, and that's the Hanafis. And then there is the last position, which I consider the most preferable position, and that is that al Jumu'ah bil Ithnain Siwal Imam, and that is that Jumu'ah is a will be considered a legitimate act of worship. If there are two people besides the imam, meaning there's the imam and there's at very least two people to preach to. There's the imam and at least two people to preach to. That is consist that would be considered a jumwah. And that is a riwaya narration on Imam Ahmed. That was the position of Ibn Taymiyyah. It is also the position of modern day scholars like Sheikh bin Baz, Abdul Aziz Ibn Baz, as well as Sheikh Uthaymeen, Muhammad Ibn Salih, and Uthaymeen, Rahimullah Ta'ala, and a host of other scholars. They're of the position that Jumu'ah is legitimate. It is a legitimate, valid act of worship if there are is the Imam and two additional people, three people in total. So not too different than the Hanafis who say four people, the Mu'addin, the Imam, and two people. And they base this off of a statement 
the the ayat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Jumu'ah, he said that, you know, when you hear the call for salat, fas'aw ila dhikrillah, then hasten to the remembrance of Allah. And he used the word fas'aw, which is the uh, command, the verb, the command form for hasten. And the command form, they say, is uh, uh, at least three people. And so they say the imam and two other people. So as long as there are three people, meaning the imam to give the khutbah and at least two people to preach to, then is this considered a jumu'ah. As well as another hadith, and I'll end with this, and I want you guys to pay attention to this hadith. I want you to pay attention to this hadith because we, we've probably heard this hadith before, but it probably never resonated until now. Here again, circumstances makes things resonate a little different. Circumstance make things resonate a little different. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, مَا مِنْ ثَلَاثَةٍ فِي قَرْيَةٍ لَا تُقَامُ فِيهِمُ الصَّلَاةِ إِلَّا اسْتَحْوَذَ عَلَيْهِمُ الشَّيْطَانِ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, مَا مِنْ ثَلَاثَةٍ There are no three people في قَرْيَةٍ that reside in a neighborhood, in a village, in a city. No three Muslims who reside in a village, in an area, and they do not establish the salat together except the shaitan has overpowered them has taken advantage of them three of you live on the same street and you don't establish the salat together three 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 house three muslim households within the same vicinity and you don't at least establish the salat together then shaitan has taken advantage of you how can you be deluded? How can you ignore? How can you, you know, I mean, even if you pray at home with your family, alhamdulillah, I have a lot of children. I have a huge family on my own. Walillahi alhamd. And we're going to, whether we have Jumu'ah in my house, in this house, or in my other house, we are going to have Jumu'ah. I'm sorry. I'm not going to sit around and wait for a masjid to open in order for me to have Jumu'ah. My iman depends on it. My spiritual life depends on it. So I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not sitting around waiting for a message to open. And so therefore, I don't have to ask my boss for Jumu'ah off on Friday anymore because the message is closed. So now I can just spend that extra time at work. La wallahi, man. Don't let shaitan play with you like that. Faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dictates a certain mindset, which dictates a certain set of behaviors that cannot be negotiated, cannot be compromised. So for sisters... I know it is not wajib for sisters to attend Jumu'ah, and many sisters do not attend Jumu'ah. But if you can find, you know, an Islamic speaker, someone that, you know, during the time of Jumu'ah, or you, someone going live with Jumu'ah, to go listen in, so at least you get the message. Stop taking advantage of the fact that, oh, I, you know, Jumu'ah is not wajib on women. So what do you just sit at home and continue watching TV during the time of Jumu'ah? Or do you find something Islamically suitable to do during that time so at least you feel like you are on par with the rest of the Muslims? So that at least you feel like you are connected to the rest of the Ummah. While everybody else is having Jumu'ah, you're sitting at home watching, you know, whatever you're watching on TV because Jumu'ah is not an obligation on the women. La wallahi. Your faith depends on it. Your iman depends on it. And maybe this situation is good for us in that we start to become in tune with our religion. We start to manifest, you know what I mean, the understanding of our religion in our daily practices now. Now it's a must. Because your faith depends on it. Six weeks from now, let's just say the masajid never open anymore. Then what? We wait until six weeks from now until we realize they're playing games with us. They're never going to open the masajid anymore. And then, you know, we got to start from there or do, you know, you know, it, the ball is still rolling. Whether the message is open or not open, I, I don't care. I'm still going to have Jumu'ah. I'm still going to pray my prayers in congregation, even if you do it with your own children. Get your children up. Make them line up. Establish a rank. For, for, you know, make one of them lead the Salat and you're still praying in congregation and you still get the reward of congregational Salat. As a matter of fact, your reward might be doubled because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows many of us want to pray in the masjid. Many of us want to pray in the masjid. My children love going to the masjid. Many of us want to, and we're still rewarded for our intention. 
you're still rewarded for your intention. Even though you can't, the Prophet ﷺ took a group of his companions and he traveled and he turned around and he said, there's not a hill that we climb over or valley that we travel through, except that there are companions who are way back in Medina who are getting the same reward that we're getting, even though they're not here because they wanted to be here. And so their intention is still rewarded for it. So we get the reward for praying in Jama'ah and we get the reward for still wanting to pray in the masjid even though due to circumstances we are not. Khair al khair. We are, we're always in a good situation. Always. That's the believer. We're always in a good situation. I'll open up for a couple of minutes for a couple of questions inshallah ta'ala. Please keep it to a minimum and please don't come with anything rational. Don't come with anything irrational. Or anything illogical, inshallah. Jazakumallahu khayran wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima kathira wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.